Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The feast day of St. John. Happy feast day. The, St. Justin Popovich says that the Acts of the Apostles, of course, are the continuation of the Gospels, but that life of the Holy Spirit continuing in the Church, the life of the Gospel being proclaimed, and the lives of the saints, of course, are the continuation of the Acts of the Apostles. So the Gospel is proclaimed in the lives of the saints. The Gospel is not a dead document that happened with four books thousands of years ago. It's within the lives of these saints we see themselves take place. So I always have a hard time, but not a hard time, with this feast day. Last year, I was at the Roquefort Church for this feast, because I typically try not to miss it when I can. And, of course, Father John being Father John, a couple minutes before the sermon, he said, uh, my son, you're preaching today, aren't you? He's done that to me thousands of times over the years. I said, well, I suppose yes, Father, may be blessed. And I did. People liked it, because St. John is a rather easy topic for me. I feel very familiar, but yet unfamiliar, because he's so holy. All the saints are holy, but so many of the virtues are encompassed in St. John. Archbishop Anthony, his successor in San Francisco, who was a fairly righteous man in his own right, a great schema monk who, till his dying day, you could hear prostrations going on in the middle of the night, wherever his cell was. He was a very ascetic man, but as a he was a younger man, well, he lived to be very old, so he wasn't very young when that happened, actually, but when he first came to San Francisco, and all the turmoil was going on around the Deacon John, and people were suing him about funds, spitting on him in the streets, he was met a man who was persecuted by those around him. And he kept silence about it, as the Lord kept silence. The Deacon Anthony was one of those people that was on the side opposing him. He listened to all the people. He listened to those bishops that apparently liked their power as much as the Pharisees. They didn't like this new saint in their midst. And so he listened to the crowd, the in crowd, and went with it. He soon realized he was wrong, certainly after St. John's death. And the Deacon Anthony wrote the service to him, essentially most of the service to him, and correctly fixed it. He was so humble at his love for Vedika John, even after the mistake he had made and was assured of Vedika's forgiveness, that he never entered the cathedral in San Francisco, which was his cathedral, without first going down to the crypt and getting his blessing to serve, St. John's blessing to serve, the relics. It's a good example for us, but why did he do this? St. John was an amazing man. Perhaps we can focus on a few areas. We all have probably heard many stories about him. Yes, he levitated when he prayed, he appeared in other places to other people when he was alive, walked through locked doors, people saw him in hospitals but he couldn't possibly have gotten into them, he glowed with the uncreated light, miracles were taking place within his own life. He's known very much for his love, for everyone. And the homily I heard from now Bishop Irenae, who said, that he focused on when they changed the vestments on his incorrupt body, how astounded he was at the feet. Because St. John's feet never stopped moving. They were the gospel right there, looking at those feet and living the Christian life. Because those feet not only stood for untold hours in church. If you think my services are long, the Deacon John's were far long. He would not skip anything in the service and thought it absurd to do so. <coughs> the Deacon John, as a matter of fact, on that topic, was known with Bishop Nectari, a blessed memory, to often leave the cathedral when things perhaps hadn't been done, extra things, and go back to his cell and make sure everything was done, to read them himself. He wanted those prayers. He thirsted for that communion with God. Those feet stood in the services. But those feet, as you know, who didn't sleep in a bed and in a chair all the time, the feet were always down. Those feet walked all over most of the continents of the earth, whether it was Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asia, even Africa, South America, North America, Washington, D.C., at the steps of the capital to get the Russians into this country who were being persecuted. They walked. But they also walked from hospital to hospital to hospital for years. People remember looking out the windows, whether it was in Shanghai or whether it was in Paris, wherever he was, and him walking to hospitals when a bus wasn't available. He wasn't opposed to cars. 
But he often, for time's sake, just walked, sometimes many miles. And if it was pouring rain or freezing, he still walked. And his feet, as we've often heard the stories, were bare. So a lot of people have tried to attribute this to him being somewhat of a fool for Christ's sake, and perhaps there's an element of truth to that. But people I've known who knew him think it's not true. His feet hurt very badly from all the efforts those feet made. And so shoes hurt. So more often than not, he had sandals with bare feet. People that had certain proprieties, this bothered them. But St. John really didn't seem to care about those things. And wasn't that he wasn't careful. Now he went from hospital to hospital to hospital, visiting everybody he could, typically looking for Russian names in certain places, so he could go give them the communion, give them confession, whatever they needed. He healed them to be with them, he spent time with them. And he never stopped doing this. We heard a story in the canon last night of a Jewish woman who was sick in the hospital, and Vidika John, not worried about the conventions of this world and political correctness, didn't cross his mind. The first thing he says when he walks into the room is, Christ is risen. Because it's true. It doesn't matter who you say it to, it's still true. And she was healed on the spot. Perhaps she was able to accept this message. We could learn a lot from that. Now worry about what the world thinks of Christianity, but just be Christian. Just be Orthodox at all times and all places. And that's the one thing about him. There's no point in his life, whether it was in his life in his cell, or his life in the church, or his life walking on the streets, where he wasn't thoroughly orthodox. And everything that he did, this principle reigned over everything that he did, everything that he thought, everything that he talked about. He talked about Christ. His life proclaimed Christ. <clears throat> it's kind of disconcerting to many people. He wasn't quite like everybody else. The hair was quite disheveled, the cassock ripped, the feet. But it's not that he didn't care. People say that he served as a prince of the church beautifully. Really cared. But those feet cared, and they never stopped moving to see people out of love. And we can learn that. He never, it didn't matter what time of day it was or time of night, when he was asked to come, he came. That yesness principle. Asked, he came. Now, St. John also had profound humility. One priest recalls seeing him in church one time, and this other priest was deriding him, railing against him in the middle of the church, calling him a charlatan, everything, in front of everyone. But he could John never stop doing what he was doing, praying. And the people wondered, how could he do this? He said, that's between me and him. He didn't talk about the man's problems or anything. He kept those to himself, a great lesson for us all as well. One day he was asked, what about the divisions in the church in San Francisco over the money? He said, who caused this? Because the people were wanting a response that would point out those who we should be against. And he says, the devil. That is the right answer, because the devil is the cause of all our divisions and problems and anger. He just follow his will sometimes. That's our fault in the matter. At synod meetings, he was well known. This happened on more than one occasion, I'm told. He was the secretary of the synod for quite a while. And they would be given some document to read, and a couple of times there were accusations against him, calling him terrible things, accusing him of everything but being a child of God. And he would read those things as if they were someone else. Passionate, without care. And one time when he read it, he was said, he said, we need to do something about this scoundrel now. And he knew who it was. He was profoundly humble. No one could knock him away from God with anger. The Vagrius says, nothing makes man closer to a demon than anger. This didn't have it. Because he humbled himself constantly and saw his own sins. Now we have all the stories about him, and all the funny little stories, and the things about his feet and everything. But yet, he was extremely serious about prayer. He took a really long time to consume the chalice. A really long time. It took him a long time to get next door. 
He venerated every icon of the church when he lived like it was the last time he was going to see them like they were personal friends, because they were. The children in his school, he always made sure that he would ask them, what day is your saint's day? Tell me about your saint. After church, he would ask them, what was the gospel today? So the people were responsible for listening. He would talk to them and teach. And by the way, with children, he rescued many children out of dumpsters in Shanghai and put them in orphanages and took care of them himself. Many. Because he followed the gospel. Those were little Christs he was seeing. And that's what he loved them for. They were Christ's children. He was told that one time, a reader of Holy Week had a very long reading. And these services, of course, were going on and on. He decided he would skip a couple pages when he hears from the distance very loudly. And Vedika John begins to say them by heart out loud. It's not just me that corrects through the services. He always did it. I know many people that were corrected by him during services. They learned to be very careful in the services and to care about these things. Because the way the services go do matter. And the details do matter. As a matter of fact, when he was in Shanghai, every Thursday he would have a meeting of the clergy. If you didn't come, you better have a good excuse. Every Thursday he would get together to discuss liturgical matters, and he would quiz them on things that were coming up, differences that would come up in spring services. But you know what? They knew the services because of him very well. He cared about his prayer. He was always saying, he wouldn't go into his cell with someone without praying for a while first and then talk to them. Everything was prayer, because everything was God. God filled up everything in his life. That's why the details matter. They were about God, out of love for God. I've had the privilege in my life of being around many people who were with him. Altar boys, orphans. I had a parishioner in Santa Fe, Claudia Kosimiki who could still remember with tears in her eyes when she would tell me the story, being in the Philippines to Babao and seeing St. John pray the storms away, because no storms hit there when he was there. She saw him on the beach doing that. It wasn't just a story from a book. Father George Laren had the privilege of serving with several times in my life. Many stories about him in those St. John books told me he was nine years old before he knew that all priests didn't glow when they served at the altar. Because he had only seen St. John serve to that point. Father George, by the way, is that priest that the young man was the young man who made eat sausage during Lent because he tried to live off bread and water without telling his parents. So St. John punished him with that obedience. Father Valeri Lukianov, who was many years his altar boy, he was this is the priest that I and the young priest used to frequently call to ask him liturgical minutia myself because he had learned it in the faith of St. John. He really knew the services. St. John has been in many of our lives. In my own life, I've had the blessing of three times venerating those relics. I can't describe it to you. You have to go do it yourself. I've venerated other relics. The grace is palpable in that building. The first time I went there, big, big troubles were coming up in my life. I didn't know that. But I just felt so at home. And I did not want to leave. I didn't know why at the time. But he was my father. A father like I never had. And I was in his embrace. And it was really difficult for me to leave that day. And when I go back, I still thank him for that. Because he gave me tremendous strength. He has appeared to many people I know and comforted them and promised to be there for them. And from experience, I can tell you he is. If you call on his prayers, he's a quick intercessor and a great helper of our lives. But the reason he is that way is because of the gospel, that gospel of Luke's Beatitudes and the, and the difficulties of Luke too, the weeping, or John's life. Because he loved Christ, he became completely transparent to Christ. He became a true apostasis who was revealed because he emptied himself and was filled up with the person of Christ. 
And that did make him some automaton. He was like everyone else that we think was going to be dangerous and going to happen to us if we follow Christ in every detail. He became a unique man. He was very unique. And all the saints are very unique. But with the same principle, the gospel commandments, and ultimately, love of the most holy trinity. St. John prayed to God for us. Amen. Amen.